I am a priest at the Vatican City in Italy. I was approached by a bishop today with something that has to have been a mistranslation. Let me explain who I am and why I am here. My name is Father Edward Thomas. I was born in the United States and became a priest of the Catholic Church when I was 20. I am an exorcist. I am told that I am a very good exorcist, but I do not feel I am. Out of my nearly 120 exorcisms, only 25 of the possessed have survived said exorcism. In all cases, the demon was expelled, the soul of the possessed saved, but the body can only take so much for so long. Most of the time I have come too late and the family hasn't given proper medical care before my arrival. Yes, you just heard a priest tell you that if you're possessed, see a doctor first and during your possession. I can heal your spirit and perhaps save your mind, but your body is still a physical thing. While prayer may expedite healing, your body still needs to be tended to by a medical professional. Treat it like a temple, my children. I am a spiritual professional, not a medical one. I even recall an exorcism call where I arrived only to find a young man in question tied down to a bed, demanding to be released. The reason the family thought the young man possessed? The possessed was suffering from gender dysphoria. She felt she was a woman in a man's body. I had her released by the family and brought to proper medical and mental health professionals. I felt for her. I did. Her family felt her condition so odd that they believed it was against God and she must be suffering from possession. Other illnesses also will get the ill-informed to call me, such as someone with seizures or schizophrenia. Misdiagnosis aside, I have always felt that an exorcism where the possessed doesn't survive is a failed one. The church disagrees. Despite this, I continue my work at the Catholic Church. I do so because I know there are less scrupulous priests who have the arrogance to believe they can heal in the name of God our Lord, as well as cast out demons. Such a way of thinking leads too easily into pride. An exorcist must be humble, honest, and pure. This is needed because otherwise a demon can feed off of the exorcist's own sin and endanger the soul of the possessed. It's why the old adage calls for an old priest and a young priest, the idea being that the young priest can remind the old of his place while the old shares experience. I am somewhere in between old and young, but I am called when the local priest cannot handle the exorcism themselves. The Vatican has called me more in the past two years than they have in all the time I was an exorcist before. I have even begun training more exorcists in the Vatican when I myself am not casting out demons. The issue that half of my charges have happened in the last two years is not lost on me. These are not false alarms or misdiagnosis. Demons are possessing people at a higher rate than normal, believe it or not. That led me to the letter I received from one Bishop Bernardo Ricci. Dear Father Thomas, your reputation precedes you, Father. I have reviewed your performance and your understanding of the unclean is beyond reproach. A specialized project has been brought by the Pope himself after the apprehension of a warlock who goes by the name of Imunda. He is in possession of a highly powerful artifact, which we plan to use to summon a demon. You are being requested to lead a group of priests in charge of containing the creature. Please come to me as soon as possible. The Most, Reverend Bernardo Ricci My Italian must be off. That's how I read it, but that can't be. It must mean that this warlock, Imunda, has summoned forth a demon that must be sent back to hell. Frightening as that is, I know I must hurry to the bishop to aid him. Despite their knowledge, having worked in the field with these creatures gives one a different experience I cannot expect a typical bishop or even a cardinal to fully grasp. Again, I do not put much stock in my own skill, but rather fear that their own pride may empower the creature. 
I arrive at the bishop's office, announce myself, and he greets me with Ernest, immediately taking me down several long hallways. Father Thomas, thank God you made it here swiftly. You caught me while I was providing lessons to my fellow priest, Bishop Ricci. I received your letter and came here as swiftly as I could. I say in Italian. I speak it far better than I can read it, apparently. The bishop stops at the end of a long hallway and then places his crucifix into an indentation in the wall. He turns to me and gives me a serious look. I see an intensity behind his graying eyes, the wrinkles around them and his forehead showing great concern. Thank you, Father Thomas. Your expertise is required for us to truly address the situation. As the hallway opens to a secret passage, I'm guided in by the bishop downward. I adjust my bag over my shoulder. In it, I have all the tools I normally would use for an exorcism, as well as some that I have never needed to. Bishop, this Emunda, what object has he managed to find? The bishop continues down the hallways, LED lights illuminating as we head down several corridors. He claims he found it in the United States, in a city in New Hampshire, of all places. I'm confused. New Hampshire? He found an object that could allow him to summon a demon? It could do far more. We are still studying it. It contains an incredible spiritual power the likes of which we have never seen before, the bishop explains. We enter a huge complex down below in what was once a catacomb. Now, it appears to be a prison of some sort, a very modern prison. There are plexiglass holding cells, and in each is a self-proclaimed witch or warlock of some sort. The Vatican is not in the habit of restraining your average citizen, holding a ceremony when you celebrate the marriage of the sun and the earth during the summer or winter solstice is a benign thing to us. Hearsay, of course, but nothing we're going to hurl someone into a Vatican prison for, nowadays anyway. These cells are reserved for only the most unclean. The witch in the first cell, for example, who hurls herself at the plexiglass as I walk by, has been imprisoned for sacrificing her children to a demon in order to demand he possesses her neighbor. She then planned to have her possessed neighbor impregnate her with his offspring. I cleared the man of the possession before she could finish her pact. The result, of course, was that she lost her wits and her womb as she failed to meet the bargain of the demon. That is the price one pays for breaking a pact made with a demon. Hypocrite! She shouts at me. You destroyed the sanctity of my marriage! She tries to spit at me, but it only hits the plexiglass and slides down the side. I ignore her as we move to several cells down. The words of the unclean are not to be paid much mind, especially those of a woman who would give herself purposefully to a demon. My fingers squeeze the golden ring on my finger, and I think of the Lord God and his glory as we continue. We stop at a young man's cell, he has a scraggly brown beard and long hair. He wears black robes and has several very old talismans on him. I notice he has a necklace with symbols of each prince of hell surrounding a central symbol of the devil himself. Tattoos across his face also convey various packs with numerous demons, most of which I have heard of. The man is oddly calm, sitting in the room, idly caressing his beard. Given his age, I assume he must be an apprentice. Such artifacts and carvings I have only seen on some of the most experienced of warlocks brought into these halls. This means he is dealing with powers he cannot truly fathom. He is young, I remark. You are wrong, father. This man is almost 85 years of age, the bishop informs me. I look at him oddly. No matter what, there is no way he is 85. The object he obtained, he claims, rejuvenated him. The bishop turns to a dais, which stands across from his cell. On the dais, under glass and illuminated with bright white LEDs, is a small red disc, 
no longer than an inch and a half in diameter, etched into it very weakly and recently, I notice, are various symbols of a satanic origin. That same object is what he plans to use to summon the demon. I look it over, the object is reddish and solid for the most part, but the edges of it are translucent, almost like red obsidian. He found this in the United States? He claims he found it via divination, that its power called him to a burned down house where he found it in a garage of all places. The bishop turns to me. The family of that home cannot be found. He motions to the object before us. It is concentrated angel blood. I give Bishop Ricci an odd look. Angel blood? Bishop Ricci nods, looking to the warlock. He calls it Sanguine Amber. I nod. So we took this from him when he summoned the demon? Bishop Ricci shakes his head. No, father. He says he can use it to summon forth a demon. I look to the bishop, confused. So then, we have stopped him and we plan to purify this object? The bishop gives me a stern look. No, Father Thomas. The Vatican fully intends to summon forth a demon. Hello. I would just like to pop in quickly before the outro to ask you, the person watching this right now, to kindly click on the link at the top of the description. The link is to this author's Facebook page, and he has been so kind to allow me to read his story, so I would like to ask you to support him in all of his work. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to the incredible authors that allow me to narrate their stories. This author's links will be in the description. Feel free to send me your own scary story at the email on the screen, and until next time, sleep tight!